called CCB, Combat Command B, which was the equivalent of one of three uh, residents, uh, regiments in the division. The other two regiments, CCA and uh, the Reserve, were in northern Luxembourg. And uh, one of them is. Pardon? One of them was pretty close to, to, to this area. Yeah. Um, Combat Command A was um, around in the um, south of. South, well, in the Ashland area and around the Miller Tower, there was one. Combat Command A was engaging that area. Yeah, is that where they were? Yeah. We had, we, had no idea, we had no idea of where the rest of the units were. We had no communication whatsoever. Uh, and uh, as I say, my particular function was in uh, telephone communication. So we would run our telephone wires from our central headquarters out to the uh, battalion or company groups surrounding the town. And uh, it, uh, we, we, we had, you had very unusual telephone poles at that time. We had been used and trained to climb wooden poles. And here you had cement poles and they had holes in them and you had to put your feet in like this and uh, climb up uh, to the top. But we didn't always worry about telephone poles because we would string our lines across houses or trees or whatever was available. The main thing was to get the telephone line uh, up from the, uh, the ground so that uh, vehicles could pass underneath and so on. Uh, the uh, the thing about Bastogne that is uh, so memorable, at least to my mind, uh, is the tremendous uh, military barrage that just continued for days and days. It, it just, uh, you know, you become a little worried. But I will tell you this, and if you thought about what could happen to you, you were lost. All you could think about in that type of combat situation was, I can do my job today. And you saw it as a job. This is what I am supposed to do. And you did it. And you didn't give too much thought to whether, even though we were surrounded, whether or not you would be captured. As a matter of for that fact, you never thought about that. Because if you did, uh, I happen to be a psychologist, and uh, you'd go a little, uh, you know, batty. Uh, so it was a type of experience that, for many of us, lived for many, many years. Uh, that uh, you just, you just never forget it. And uh, speaking editorially myself. It's the reason why I'm so unhappy about any wars that we can engage ourselves in at the present time. So, um, so you, were, you were actually like uh, first hackers, like telephone lines hackers. How did you um, uh, use the, the uh, telephone lines to? Uh, I think I understand your question. Uh, the, the question, as I understand it, was we were like hackers, correct? That you and your six, I would hack. And, <laughs> and then your question was, did we tap, tap into those telephones? We didn't use them at all. We didn't use the the Belgium uh, system at all, or the German system. We put up our own wire, and we would have two vehicles that we used. One was called a half track, which was a larger vehicle and it had big rolls of wire on the back. The other was the peep or jeep. We'd have wire on the back of that, and we'd, we'd lay our own wire. So there was no uh, 
the, the communication system of the Belgians at that time was just destroyed. I mean, we, we didn't use it. So I didn't have to hack. Also, the phones maybe as an explanation. The phones at the time that the American Army used um, are not comparable to our modern phones that we have at home. Those phones basically only work from one phone to another with a wire. So if you had a smaller telephone, unfortunately we don't have one here with us now. No, no, they are about no. this high. They work with two standard double D batteries, and then you you have a little you have your your phone, and you have a little crank crank to to turn, and then. When you turn the crank, it rings on the other side and the other way around. So you can talk really only from one phone to the next phone. And if you want to talk to more people, you have to. It has to go by by switchboard. By switchboard. And then those the person that is sitting on the switchboard can connect you from one phone to another. Um, so basically, also this phone line can vary from 100 meters up to 10 kilometers or even more. But you can only basically only talk from one phone to another. One. So it's not comparable to any modern house phones that we use at the time. Maybe another word that, that I think is here very important. We are used to our modern technology and to our modern type of communication. Um, you can of course not compare that from nowadays to, 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 the, to the standard that we were in there in 1944. Um, maybe uh, some of you, they uh, still have those little walkie-talkies that you, you might, might know. Uh, they usually they reach up to three or four kilometers and are about this big nowadays. Mm -hmm. But at the time, the first walkie-talkie was basically invented and it was bigger than this bottle and about six kilograms of weight. And it was working uh, the same distance than our smaller type walkie-talkies that we have nowadays. How did you stay in touch with the family? Oh, I think that's a very important question. <laughs> How did you stay in touch with your family? Like, uh... <laughs> how, uh, your question, if I understand it, is how did we stay in touch with our families? Yeah. Uh, with some difficulty. Uh, we, we had uh, in the American Army, we had in the American Army uh, what we call uh, female, uh, which was- Not a, email, uh, female, female. 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 It was a small uh, piece of paper and you could write your message on there that was and you couldn't tell them where you were or anything. All you could say, well, it's snowing today. But that was about the limit of your, and how are you, and uh, I love you, and, and you know, uh, and so on. But you could never talk about what you were doing. Uh, and that was uh, sent, uh, I don't know how, they, I guess they sent them on boat. And then we would get letters back. And uh, those of us in Bastogne, I think we got our first letters about uh, a week or so after the uh, German siege had been broken. Is that about right? I would have thought it might have been a little longer than that. Okay, uh, it was some, and so that uh, the letters came and you stood there. Have you ever been at the airport waiting for your bag to come? Your luggage, and you say, "When is it going to come?" When is it going to come? <laughs> and you're the last one. Well, that's how we waited for our mail. Uh, I had I had one experience uh, that is I'll never forget. But it was a, a day or two after the. The German siege had been lifted, and somebody yelled out in the street, is there anybody here from Chicago? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm not here from Chicago. And it was a newspaper reporter. And uh, so he wanted to talk to people from Chicago. So I went out to talk to him, and he represented himself from a uh, a newspaper in Chicago, and it so happened when I was 
uh, a boy, I, I don't know if you do it here, but I delivered those newspapers on my bicycle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pass it over. No. <laughs> they have to stay longer. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he wrote an article about Chicagoans relate to hell of Bastogne, Bastogne. And uh, it was on, you know, the big banner headline. And uh, of course, I didn't know this. And uh, my name was in there with my uh, home address and so on, and a few things that I had said in the article, and that was the first that my uh, sister, who was my remaining relative, uh, knew that I was there. And other than that, then I didn't find out about that until a month later. So I made the headlines in the Chicago newspaper, and that's the last time. <laughs> The Army told us, uh, you can't keep a diary. What if you were captured and it fell into enemy hands, you know? So uh, that was absolutely not the thing to do. Although some people that I know eventually cheated a little bit and they did kept a diary. I wish that I had, but I... Uh, you know, if they told you, don't do this, well, okay, I won't do it. Uh, but it would be nice if I would had it today to look back on uh, all that happened during that time. My memories of Christmas dinner, uh, Bob, I don't know what you had. I had cheese and crackers, and I was glad to get them. A lot of fellows didn't even have that. Did they come out of those boxes? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could explain a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, talking about food, what was the daily food that you were served? <laughs> Maybe show me to that, because they don't know what, what a K-ration is. A K-ration had uh, a little bit of cheese, uh, a few crackers, <laughs> three cigarettes. <laughs> three three cigarettes. cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper. No, oh, that was very important. <laughs> and, uh, chewing gum. Oh, oh chewing, gum. Uh, okay. chewing gum or candy? No, a piece of candy, I guess. Chocolate. Uh, chocolate. Uh, but as I said, three cigarettes. And. Uh, by the way, I didn't smoke at that time, so I saved my cigarettes over a period of time. And then when I uh, was later on, had an opportunity to go to Paris, I carried those cigarettes and they traded. <laughs> Services? Services. No, no. <laughs> they traded money. Money for those cigarettes. Oh, yeah. But uh, as a result of our eating this for some time, we tended to lose weight. You did? Yes, I, I, I lost con considerably. And I imagine you did too. I but. think I did, yes. And, yes. Uh, how many rations did you get per day? Like one, one box per day, or sometimes no? Maybe two. Well, if you were lucky. Initially, it was planned that you had one breakfast unit, one um, dinner, and one supper unit. So there was one per one unit, well, one box per per meal. But uh, mostly, I guess they didn't arrive no. in the we, way that uh, towards the end, was, before the German siege was listed, we were down to very little. And, and then uh, we moved. We moved up to what they call seed rations, and that they were in little cans, and you could heat those, and that was a little bit more nourishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from there, you moved up to. May I have that right there? Sure. This was our mess kit, so you would move up to the 
company kitchen, and the cook would go, splat. Come in here. And you go, splat here, and splat here. And then you eat with this spoon, or whatever. You didn't have to worry, you didn't have to worry about cutting anything, because it wasn't anything. But, uh, and that, was, that was a big meal. And we ate on these for quite a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, and this is our mess kit. And then after you eat, there are three uh, large cans, would be uh, uh, cans like garbage cans, and one of them would have soap in it. And the next one would have was for rinsing, yeah. and the third one was clear water. And so you went and <laughs> and you had a, a, a smart boys had a little piece of we call it grillo. It's a little scrapey thing. Oh yeah. And you'd clean out your mess kit because if you didn't clean out your mess kit, you had disastrous results with your stomach. They know what you mean. <laughs> but going on talking about food, who of you likes chocolate? <laughs> 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 